we don't um, uh, have to draw attention to the fact that the last two months have been very severe for our nation, uh, both in terms of natural disasters and in terms of uh, human recklessness and violence and hatred. And then here in the Bay Area, this past uh, eight days, we've had uh, terrible fires. And uh, um, I was traveling this past week and, and, and flew over the fires on the way north. And it, it reminded me of what you would see from a, a documentary regarding the war. Uh, you know, just, just, just the scale is hard to, frankly, imagine. And, uh, you know, as most of you know, I'm from Southern California, and this time of year, fires are, are pretty natural, ha natural hazards down there. But this is, this is a devastation that I don't recall ever seeing before. It's just, it's massive, and the amount of people killed, the amount of uh, damage done uh, to, to not just structures, but uh, lives have been shattered. We need to pray uh, for, for mercy. Uh, the scale of this, the last time I checked, is over 180,000 acres, but they're measuring it in, in miles. Uh, one, one was in, in something in the neighborhood of, of almost, almost 300 square miles. Uh, and that, that's just an unbelievable amount of, of space being burned. Uh, so I want us to pray for those whose lives have been totally shattered by this. Uh, you know, insurance and things like that can, can replace some things, but can't replace can't replace all that your life was, can't replace a life lost. And, and then I want us to pray for the firefighters and the first responders. Uh, they must be weary. Uh, I know that people are being called out from, from all over the state and nation to help and to assist. And, um, and so let, I want us as a congregation to pray, ask the Holy Spirit to be gracious and kind. And it's not a bad thing to ask the weather to change, okay? And ask that the winds blow off the ocean instead of off the desert. And ask that the Lord would send some rain. Uh, it's not a bad thing to ask for that, all right? So let's go to him right now. Father, we, we come to you because we can. We come to you because you said to. We come to you because we know that you are gracious and you are merciful. And Lord God, we, we come to you once again, expressing a need in, in our nation. Uh, Lord, and this, this one's our neighborhood. This is, this is close to home here. Uh, I know, Father God, that we have friends and family members. We have pastors and colleagues that are serving the communities up there. And I ask and pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch all of the ministers, all of the pastors, all of the Christian leaders that are reaching into the community, first within their community of faith and then within their community at large, to help those who have been shattered by this, to help those who are without home, without food, without shelter. Would you anoint and enable them? And Lord God, would you raise up the resources financially that are necessary? to minister to all of these individuals who, are, who have been stranded and abandoned and, 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 and displaced by these fires. Father, we also pray for the first responders, the firefighters, the police, the sheriff, all of those, those flying aircraft, those driving trucks, those digging with, with, with picks and shovels and, and uh, chainsaws. Lord God, would you give strength to these men? Would you give strength to these women? Would you give encouragement to these and Father God, would you just do a supernatural anointing upon them? And Lord God, would you give wisdom to them in, in, in fighting these fires? Would you give wisdom uh, to those directing these, these circumstances and these situations? Father, we pray for those who have been victimized by this. Those who've lost their houses, lost their livestock, lost their pets. Those who've lost family members and friends. Father, would you comfort those who are, who are mourning? Would you, would you help and anoint us to weep with those who are weeping? And Lord God, would you somehow, some way redeem all of this? Lord, bring comfort, bring peace, bring strength. And finally, Lord, we ask for something that, that, that we, we don't take lightly and we don't make it trivial. Father, would you change the direction of the winds? Lord God, would you bring an, a, a cool breeze from the ocean? 
Father, would you bring in the clouds? Would you bring in some rain? Would you bring in some damp weather? Would you bring in some things that that would help those who are fighting these fires, Lord God, that they would be put out? And Lord, we, we know that weather patterns come and go and things of this nature. But Lord, we also know that you are in charge of all of that. So we ask for mercy, 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 mercy upon this region. Touch and minister your grace and your kindness, we ask, in Jesus' sacred and most holy name. And all those who agreed said together, Amen and Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. If you would like to contribute, the church has already sent an offering uh, to assist in this. If you'd like to contribute to that uh, or add to it, uh, there's, a, there's a note in your bulletin that lets you know how to do that. There's a, an envelope nearby. All you have to do is simply mark, mark on the envelope or on a check, uh, fire, and we'll, we'll make sure it gets to uh, where it needs to be done the most. What we're sending it to right now is, is, is uh, fellow churches who are up there. Uh, our, our pastor in Santa Rosa, his church, uh, at least five members have lost their house, and uh, they've been sheltering and keeping over 30 people every day, feeding them, uh, sheltering them, and, and helping them. And so we've been giving aid directly to them to help pay for the food and, uh, and, and the things that are necessary. Uh, if you'd like to contribute, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and, uh, and we encourage you to do so. Do as, as the Lord has placed it upon your heart. You can give it to one of the ushers after the service or uh, to Reverend uh, Minerva at, at the desk uh, in, the, in the foyer. And uh, we invite and encourage you uh, to do that. I want to I want to uh, turn your attention to, to the scripture for a few minutes and then um, I won't speak long and I won't finish the notes. Uh, so that, that that's a given. But they're in your in your bulletin. Uh, our theme this year has been this notion of ministering with the Lord, that the Lord uh, is sending us. And, and so turn with me today to Matthew chapter 10. All right, let's, I'm going to start in chapter 9, actually. But um, uh, our text has been, has been based on John 20. And the philosophy of ministry that we've been building kind of as anchor points is that uh, as children of the Lord and as ministers of the gospel, we must make the love of Christ our core competency. It must be what we are best at. We can do 99 things correctly. But if we miss that, We've missed it all. This is the the calamity of the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2, that they had done so many things well, doctrinally correct, worked hard, significant church, great work, large church. By some estimates, 50,000 believers by the end of the first century in Ephesus. But yet they had lost their first love. And Jesus said, either remember the height from which you have fallen and repent or I will remove the candlestick, which is exactly historically what took place. So we can do 99 things right, but if we don't love, it doesn't matter. Secondly, we must make the glorification of Christ our highest priority. The ministry isn't about you. The ministry isn't about me. The ministry doesn't exist for my name. It exists for the name of Christ. It is his glory that we must give time, energy, and resource Two, we must make the gospel of the ministry of Christ our sacred mission. We must recognize that it is his good news that must be preached. As we shared with those who we've recognized in terms of ordination, the passage that Paul uh, shared with the Corinthian believers, we must remember Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what we preach. This is what we live. This is what we proclaim. We need the witness of the Spirit and the flow of His grace. This is His ministry. This is His ministry. This is His anointing. We cannot do it without without His flow, without His grace, without the Holy Spirit's enablement. Let me just be blunt. You and I cannot even follow Jesus without the Spirit helping us. This notion that Christianity is some easy thing is ridiculous. The crucifixion of the flesh, 
the casting aside of our own agenda, the laying aside of our own goals, our own dreams, our own aspirations for the glory and honor of Christ is not something that is natural for the human being in its fallen condition to do. Amen. You and I need Christ in order to follow him. Amen. The very faith in which we exercise was given to us by God. And thus, how much more then do we need the anointing of the spirit in order to serve him in ministry and to lead others to him? So therefore, we exist to do the ministry of Christ and the love of Christ and for the glory of Christ by the power of Christ. So the text we've used, I've already read this morning from John chapter 20. And I'll remind you again what the 22nd verse says. As the father has sent me or the 21st verse, as the father has sent me. I am sending you as to the same degree, amount, extent, similarly, equally. So given the, the, the service theme today, I want us to briefly detour from this year's format and look at something that took place in the gospel of Matthew chapters nine and 10. So beginning in Matthew nine, verse 35, the apostle records that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues proclaiming or preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. This is a summary of the ministry of Jesus right here. One verse. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. What did the Father send him to do? He went. Where did he go? He went to towns and villages. What did he do? He taught and he preached. The difference between teaching and preaching is not volume. The difference between teaching and preaching is teaching is to explain. Preaching is to proclaim. So when you proclaim something, you are preaching for a decision. What are you, pastor? I'm primarily a preacher. In fact, if you ask me, what am I? I'm just a preacher. I'm going to proclaim the word of God to you by the best ability that God's given to me and hopefully under his anointing. Preaching to a point of decision of some kind. That doesn't mean we don't teach. Teaching is kind of what I'm doing this morning. We're explaining things. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are teaching gospels. You got, in, in two of them, you have genealogies. You have, you have uh, Matthew often records, well, Jesus did that to fulfill this. It's an explanation. Two of them begin with babies. The baby in the manger, which we're about to study in Christmas time. John's a preacher. John's a little different. John begins with, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. By him, everything was made that is made. In him was light, and that life was, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. We beheld him, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's a preacher. Amen. Deal with this. I'm going to lay this out here. You have to decide. That's a preacher. Jesus being Jesus, did both, you know, to the ultimate, okay? Teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and what else did he do? Signs and wonders, healing every disease and sickness. That's the summary verse. That's our job description. Amen. That's our job description. I'm going to take a sip of tea on that and let you think about it. Yes. That's our job description. How many of you need help to do that? Some of you are lying to me and lying to yourself. It's bad enough you lie when you're not in church. You shouldn't lie in church. So let me give you a chance. How many of you need help to do this? Oh, there you are. Okay. That's supernatural stuff. Oh, you can get skilled, you can get taught, you can get trained, you can have experience, and all that's important. But at the end of the day, you and I need the Holy Spirit to do this. Now we're going to learn something about the character of Jesus. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, notice the context. Then verse number 37, he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. What's he doing? He's looking at the crowds. He's making, a, he's making a teaching point. I wouldn't be surprised if he weren't doing it similar to this, just stretching out his hand and saying, the harvest is plentiful. And then looking at the 12, but the workers are few. Massive harvest. Not enough workers for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore... To send out workers into the harvest field. Chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, why did he do that? Remember the job description? He gave them the ability and the authority to do what he was doing. Then verses 2, 3, and 4 name the 12. And for sake of time, I, 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 I omitted that. But I wasn't omitting context for you. I'm just omitting that. Verse, 12, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or any, in, enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, why did he say that? Because the gospel is to the Jew first. In Acts 1, verse 8, to the same group, he said, go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay? But the gospel was sent to the Jews first. Vision and mission. Mission is scope of vision. Here, Jesus defines the scope. He always does that. Do I go to the uttermost parts of the earth? Sure, by God's grace. But where do I primarily go? Right here. Scope. Mission is scope of vision. That's another message. Let's go on. Verse 7. As you go, proclaim, preach. This message, the kingdom of heaven is near. That doesn't mean the return of Christ is near. That's not the message, although that's true. What that means is the rule and reign of God is near. Amen. The rule of God has come near in the person of its king, Jesus. Because Jesus is near, the kingdom is near. Proclaim this message. The king has come. It gets harder. Verse 8. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. That'll separate the men from the boys right there. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Amen. Proclaim this message. Verse 7. The rule and reign of God is near. This is the message Jesus was preaching. And show it. Amen. Do you remember kindergarten and first grade and second grade? Does anyone remember show and tell? Yes. I don't know if they do that anymore or not, okay? You bring something in, you show it, and you tell about it. Okay? Well, this is sort of like that, except it's tell and show. <laughs> proclaim the kingdom. Proclaim the, that the king is near. Proclaim that the rule and reign of God has come close in the person of its king. And then show them that. Amen. Heal the sick. Why? In our father's house, no one's sick. Raise the dead, verse 8. Why? Because in our Father's house, death is a defeated enemy. Look at verse 8 again. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. That's a commandment. Ouch. Let me ask the question I asked you a few minutes ago. How many of you need help to do this? Now, see, by now, both hands should have gone in the air. And maybe your toes should have been off the ground a little bit. <laughs> we need help. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. 
drive out demons. Now, I believe in godly Christian therapy. I do. I believe strongly in it. Okay, so I'm about to say something. I don't want you to think I'm, I'm diminishing that because I believe in that. Pastoral counseling, Christian therapeutic counseling, I believe in that. I believe all good gifts come from God. In the same way, I believe in medicine and doctors. Okay, I believe all good gifts come from God. Okay, so I have no problem with healing the sick and, pr- and having that be part of a prayer and also saying, go, go to the doctor. I do that all the time when I pray for people. They come, they ask for, I, I pray for them and they say, no, what's the doctor say? Okay, because both gifts come from the Lord. So I'm about to say something and I don't want you to take me out of context. All right. But when it comes to driving out demons, you cannot counsel out a demon. At some point, you need a supernatural infusion of grace. At some point, the power of God must encounter the situation. At some point, the kingdom of God has to come near. At some point, you got to not just talk about it, you got to show it. Freely you've received. Freely give. Beloved, we're going to talk about this all of 2018. Because we need the Holy Ghost. We need the Lord to breathe on us. We need the power of God to fill us afresh and to fill us anew. We need him to do his work. Third time. How many of you need help with this? All right. In the New Testament and in the world today, how many ministries are there? Think about it. There's an answer. You can actually you can actually give the specific number of ministries in the world. You can give the specific number of ministries in the New Testament. And there's an answer for the specific number of ministries taking place right now in the world. There is a specific number and you can answer it. And the answer is one. There is only one ministry, and it belongs to Jesus. He does his ministry through hundreds, thousands, and millions of people. But it's his ministry. It belongs to him. To the degree that I take ownership as opposed to stewardship of the ministry. The minute I begin to say stuff like, my church, my people my ministry, to every degree that I own it rather than steward it, I am choking off the flow of grace. It's not just semantical. This is serious business. The ministry is his. The church is his. The calling is his. The ordaining is his. The anointing is his. The kingdom is his. You do not own any of it. You are stewards of his. How much money that you put in the plate or the offering bag, that all belongs to the Lord. The money you kept in your wallet, the money in your savings account, the money equity in your house, the money invested in your business, the money you got hidden in a mattress somewhere, it's all his. Tithing is not you giving God 10% of your money like God needed your favor. Tithing is God letting you keep 90% of his money. Because it's all his. You get 168 hours this week. It's all his. Every energy you have is his. Every fiber of your being is his. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with how you live and how you work and how you breathe. This whole notion that somehow I can bifurcate the sacred from the secular is an idolatrous, horrific sin. 
It's all his. So if we're really going to be servants of the Lord, we need to line up with the ministry profile of Jesus. Let me put it in business terms. If you're going to do the ministry job description of Jesus, go teach, preach, heal. If you're going to do his job description, which is the only job description we have, then you need to line up with his profile. If you go to hire somebody, you, you have a job description that tells you what is going to be done. Then you have a profile, a resume of the person. Oh, wow. That tells you the kind of person they are and whether they can do that. Amen. Are you understanding me? Yeah. Putting it in business terms for you guys, okay? So if we have a job description that is teaching, preaching, healing, and all of these things, that that's, that's the activity of the job, then the character of the job, the character of the kind of person you are in order to do that job has to line up with Jesus. See, so in other words, before you can be an apostle, one sent, you have to be a disciple, one who follows. That's really good. You need to write that down somewhere. I need to write it down so I don't forget. It, okay. Before you can be an apostle, one who is sent, you have to be a disciple, one who follows. So in Jesus, we need to learn how to see, number one in your notes, what he sees. We must see what he sees. We're looking at ourselves wrong. We're looking at ourselves horrifically. We're judging people by their skin color, by their clothing, by the car they're driving, by the house they're living in, by the accent in which they speak. We got to see people differently. We have to see the world differently. We have to see one another differently. We have to look at things differently. We need to see as Jesus sees. Our text says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What do you see? In your family. Amen. Do you know how awful the world's becoming? And we think it's out there somewhere. No, 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 no. It starts right here. What do you see in your family? How do you view that prodigal in your life? How do you view that spouse? How do you view that ex-spouse? How do you view those that God put within your sphere of influence? How do you see one another? Do we only see the externals? Do we only see the, the mask that someone's portraying for us? Or can we look a little further? Can we go a little deeper? Can we understand that the lost are lost? The wicked are wicked. Why are we shocked when the wicked act wickedly? Why are we overwhelmed when the lost act like they're lost? And one of the great tragedies is when the lost happen to find their way into the doors of a church and we look at them with scrutiny. Is this not supposed to be a hospital? Isn't it a tragedy when you go into the emergency room and you're mad that there's so many sick people? Do you know who is in bed in an ICU? Those who are really, really sick and about to die. 
if they don't have intensive care given to them. What do you see? When you look out over Oakland, what do you see? When you drive into Walnut Creek or Livermore or Danville, what do you see? The way urban centers in this nation and suburban centers in this nation look at each other is a tragedy. And it starts with the urban church and the suburban church. We're the ones salt and light. We're the ones who are supposed to see each other differently. If we don't build the bridge, who will? How can we be shocked when the world is fragmented, when the church is fragmented? You see, before we can preach, teach, and heal, we have to see differently. Jesus, looking at the disciples, looking at a crowd in John, the fourth chapter. Let me give you a little context. This is the story of the woman at the well. The Lord had ministered to her. Again, she was an outcast. He saw her differently than everybody else did. And in meeting Christ, her heart was changed. And she went and became an evangelist. And went into the Samaritan village and said, come see a man who told me everything about my life. And this woman, this outcast, this woman that that was of such ill repute that she wasn't at the well in the morning and the evening, but in the middle of the day. Suddenly became a person of profound influence. Because that's what happens when Jesus meets you. And so she gets all of the village and they're coming out. It is in that context of the disciples sitting there with Christ and the village coming out. Again, Jesus, the great teacher, he, he, he then looks at his 12 and he says, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you. And I see it like this, that the Lord's looking. Says, Open your eyes and look. Look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. What do we see? What do we see? How do you look at the young man on the corner selling stuff you know he shouldn't be selling? How do you look at the young lady selling her body? Abused and broken. Open your eyes and look. How do you see your family? How do you see your school? How do you see your friends? How do you see your job? How do you see our nation? How do you see the world? You can't do the ministry of Jesus until you begin to have his lens. Lord, open my eyes to see the harvest? Do we only see the obstacles? Do we only see the great tragedy? Or do we see the great opportunity? I'll give you number two and we'll talk about it next time. We got to feel what Jesus feels. Not only do I need to see what he sees, I need to feel what he feels. See, I'm talking about the ministry profile. I'm talking about the disciple who will become the apostle. I'm talking about the servant who becomes the server. I'm talking about the one who follows Jesus. I need to see the world through his lens. I need to feel the world through his heart. The scripture says he had compassion on them. King James used to speak of this word of bowels of mercy, of bowels of compassion. And we think, well, that's just a weird. No, it's actually kind of literal. 
It literally means when your heart aches, when it hurts way down here. I've been in this ministry 36 years. And to my shame and regret, I can tell you, I don't live there like I should. I, my heart hurts for you. I have great sympathy and empathy. But see, I have grandchildren and I have children. And I know now the difference when one of them is wounded and how that aches me. You see, Jesus looked at the crowd, the crowd that way. Because he could see every individual soul within the crowd. We look at the crowd like a mob. We've lost the ability to see and therefore we've lost the ability to hurt. Because iniquity abounds, the love of most will grow cold. You can't be over here preaching teaching, casting out demons, healing sick folks, raising dead folks, freely giving, if you've not first been over here, freely receiving. What do I receive? Oh, Lord, send the power just now. I love that song, but that's not what it's about. Oh, Lord, make me look like Jesus. Help me to see as he sees. Help me to feel as he feels. Help me to perceive the world through his lens so that I might feel the world through his heart. Then I can look at this one and this one and this one and this one the way he is. And when I'm looking at them the way he is, guess what? His ministry goes. Mm -hmm. Because it's unfettered by me any longer. This is our calling. This is our job description. So for the fourth time, how many of you need help with this? So when we ask the Lord to help us to do this, you know where he's going. He's not going over here on the apostle side. He's going over here on the disciple side. He's going on the character building. He's going on the resume side. He's going to build your spiritual resume. And qualify you for the work. That's where he's going. So don't whine about it when it comes. Don't come whining to me about how hard it is. Because you know what? I'll sit there and whine with you about how hard it is. Christianity isn't for sissies. You got to follow Jesus and that's a tough place because it means cross carrying, cross bearing and walking through the fire. But he has promised, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Stand with me, please. Amen. Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we come to you humbly today. Even as we have recognized your anointing upon the lives of pastors even as we have recognized your grace and your service in our own hearts, even as we have recognized that we really, really, really need your help. We cannot do your work without your anointing. We cannot do your work without you breathing on us. We cannot be about your business without you sending and helping and enabling us. For we recognize that there is a supernatural dynamic to our faith. And so, Lord, as we recognize that, we also recognize that we don't see one another correctly. We don't view the loss correctly. We don't even view our family correctly. We don't see the brokenness in the world correctly. We don't see the woundedness in the world correctly. We don't see people as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Lord, there's there's almost a smugness at times 
There's almost an arrogance at times. And then at other times, Lord, there's a helplessness and a hopelessness that fills our hearts. That it's all just too much. Would you please help us to see you correctly first and foremost? Would you please help us to see the Lord God high and lifted up, mighty in power, capable of deliverance, healer of souls, deliverer of nations. Help us to see you correctly and help us to follow Jesus, not half-heartedly, not sort of, not occasionally, but wholeheartedly with passion and depth and fervor and grace. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to see what you see and to feel what you feel. Lord, would you fill us afresh and anew with the vitality, the vigor, the breath of heaven, that we would be about your work, that we would find delight in worship, that we would find delight in prayer, that we would find delight in your word, that yes, Lord, we would have the, the, the disciplines that go with growth, but Lord God, that we would have the supernatural vitality, the breath of heaven that fills our life with energy, Holy Ghost energy. To follow you and to go forth from here serving you. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed. If you're in this room you say, Pastor, I do not know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to surrender my life to him today. Would you hold your hand up and I'll pray with you where you are. The choice is yours. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I do not know Christ, but I want to surrender my life to him. God bless you. In the name of Jesus. You need him. We all do. We need him. Is there anybody else? I'm going to ask the whole congregation to pray with me. And you that raised your hands, please make this prayer your prayer. The Lord sees your hands as I do. And the reason I ask you privately is just so that I'm praying with you. Jesus said, if two or three of us agree as to touching something, it'll be done. Even more importantly, the word of God tells us that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Lord knows your heart as well as your mind. And he knows the surrender in your heart. So we're going to pray this right now. And you that lifted your hands, especially make this your prayer. But the rest of you, would you please join with me as we join with them? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I recognize my great need for Jesus Christ. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess that I can't do this without your help. I believe that the Word of God is true. I believe you love me. I believe you sent your Son because you love me. I believe Jesus died on the cross taking my place. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, conquering my sin and conquering death. So I surrender to you right now. I call upon your name. Save me. Forgive me. Deliver me. I surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Hallelujah and amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Pastor Mata, if you would come and stand down here. And Reverend Fears, I don't see you. I know you're around. If you would come and stand down here, as well as Dr. Rebecca. You that raised your hands. After the service is dismissed, would you please come and allow one of these to pray with you and just to, just, to, just to ask the Lord's mercy and grace to be upon you? Now, how many of you need healing in your body or you know someone you love that needs healing in their body? Would you hold your hands up? Let's pray one for another. Heavenly Father, would you stretch forth your hand and heal? Would you bring deliverance into these lives and into these hearts? 
Father, would you do the miracle we can't do? Would you heal rheumatoid arthritis? Would you heal other arthritic conditions? Would you heal diabetic conditions? Would you drive cancers from bodies? Would you heal hypertension? Would you heal, Lord God, all of the various blood disorders that are rampaging within our, 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 our people and within the people of our nation? Uh, HIV, hepatitis, and diabetes, diabetes, and all of these things. Lord, let the blood go in order in Jesus' name. Father, those that have been severely wounded and scarred, would you bring healing to their mind? Would you bring healing to their emotions? Would you bring healing to their thought life? Would you bring healing to their, to their, their, their sense of self and identity? Oh, Lord God, would you stretch forth your hand and would you please heal your people, I ask, in Jesus' precious and most holy name. And finally, Lord, I also pray for provision. Would you provide resource into the hearts and lives of your people? Father God, that they would steward well the resources you've given to them. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name.